Okay, so I would start with a with a with a thank you to all who join us today. Join us today, and um, we are also very excited and very grateful for our today's speaker, Professor Johann Petrowski Stern. Mm. Uh, I would like to say also some background info on the on the speaker, and then we can start with the presentation and afterwards discussion. So, um, Professor Petrovsky Stern is a Ukrainian American historian, literally scholar, philologist, essayist, translator, and an artist. Um, he went on and got his master's degree in the Kiev National Tarasuchenko University on philology of German and Romans languages. Then, the first PhD was on comparative literature in Moscow State University, and the second from the Brandeis uh, University of Massachusetts on the modern Jewish history. Professor Petrovsky Stern is also from 2010 till the present time an associate fellow at the Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute. Uh, from 2011 till the present time, the Crown Family Professor of Jewish Studies at the Department of History and the Crown Family Center for Jewish and Israel Studies at the Northwestern University of Chicago. A professor in the Department of Philosophy uh, from 2018 at the Ukrainian Free University in Munich was also visiting professor at many Ukrainian, uh, American, Israel, and uh, other universities. In addition- And Polish, and Polish. And Polish also, thank you very much. Yeah, and um, in addition to the teaching and research, he's also an artist. Um, his artwork has appeared in several Ukrainian and American museums. Um, my personal, also my personal um, recommendation is the um, latest issue of the magazine New Eastern Europe, the, ro uh, the Road to Pax Ca Caucasia, where you can find a very interesting and I think very powerful interview with uh, Professor Petrovsky Stern on um, the topic, the new Babenya Holocaust Memorial Center is a Trojan horse for Putin's hybrid war. For those who are interested, I would maybe ask some of my colleagues to send a link uh, in the chat. Yeah, um, that will be all the background information and a little bit um, moderation information. Um, if you want to, if you have any questions during the presentation, Professor Petrovsky Stern says you are very welcome to raise a hand and ask them, or you can wait till the end of the presentation and join in in the discussion and maybe write in chat, I have a question or just raise your hand or write the question in the chat, then I will read it out loud for the YouTube um, translation. So um, thank you very much for the attention. I would like uh, now to give the floor to you, Professor, and thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, I would like to, um, uh, to say a couple of words um, about what I'm gonna talk about. Uh, first, uh, the presentation today is a uh, part of, um, of my book project, uh, which is uh, tentatively entitled uh, National Democracy Behind Bars, um, Jews, um, Jewish and Ukrainian uh, Dissidents, 1959-1989. Um, uh, I started to work um, on the book without knowing that I'm working on that book uh, long ago. And I wrote a number of articles and a couple of chapters. And then I realized um, what is uh, getting out of all of that um, seems to be a, a monograph, a book length uh, uh, project. And I spent um, a couple of years um, uh, at different archives, including the um, KGB, um, now SBU archive um, in, uh, in Kiev, um, Ivana Frankivsk, uh, Lviv, um, and other um, divisions of the KGB archive in Ukraine, uh, working on the documents on the dissidents. Now, um, what we will discuss today um, is part of this book project. And when I am uh, thinking about, every time when I'm thinking about this book project, and I look at it and I say national democracy behind bars, um, Ukrainian Jewish dissidents in the Gulag. This is our today's presentation, but actually um, I'm discussing Jewish and Ukrainian dissidents, not only in the Gulag, but also um, in the underground. Uh, I'm discussing legal and uh, uh, 
from the Soviet perspective, uh, illegal forms of um, the um, uh, human rights movement activity. Um, uh, I'm discussing um, a broader cultural perspective on uh, uh, the um, um, Soviet intelligentsia uh, in Ukraine uh, in the 1960s, 1980s. Um, and what we heard today is a uh, work in progress. Uh, so it's a draft. Um, I do not have um, a, a written text in front of me. Um, so I will uh, discuss the chapter as I would like to have it written. Um, and of course, I would love to hear, uh, to hear your uh, feedback and um, uh, if you could share with me your insights, but also uh, critical remarks, uh, that'll be um, extremely helpful. Um, although it is a seminar, um, I was asked to prepare um, a lecture. So we'll have a lecture format. I will talk for about, uh, let's say um, 45, 47 minutes, and then we'll have questions and answers. But if you like me to stop and uh, give some um, uh, more detailed definition of uh, certain terms, uh, certain names that I'm using, uh, certain events that I'm mentioning, please do so. Um, uh, as um, I'm looking at my screen right now, I see only my screen. I do not see your faces, unfortunately. Uh, so it is a kind of a lecture format. Um, if you like to uh, uh, ask a question, please uh, send your question to, um, uh, to uh, Bojena and uh, she will uh, then um, uh, ask me to stop and to um, uh, elucidate uh, this at that point um, so that we will have some sort of an interaction um, as I speak. Um, um, having said that, I would also like to mention that um, whenever I am working on my subject matters, I'm trying to use my both hands. As a literary historian um, who has some training in comparative literature, um, and as a historian who works on uh, sociocultural, uh, socioeconomic, and sociopolitical um, history with a focus on uh, Jews and with a focus on Eastern European uh, uh, Jewish history broadly conceived. What does it mean um, is that uh, sometimes I uh, emphasize um, uh, historical contexts, and I'm trying to embed the text that I'm discussing, the documents that I'm discussing, into a specific um, uh, sociocultural context. Um, in other cases, uh, or I would say in many cases, I'm also adding a literary aspect uh, to my um, uh, forays into East European Jewish history. And today I'll try to use both. So, so we'll hear. Um, um, how I'm trying to um, use both methodologies, uh, comparative literary um, and um, social historical. So let me start with, um, with, with a case um, that um, brings us back to the late 1960s, early 1970s uh, to uh, the internal documentation of the Soviet uh, uh, State Security Committee, KGB, uh, Committee of Государственной Безопасности. Um, I would like to discuss first uh, the document uh, which I found in the archive. It's one of the tens of thousands of documents that I found um, related to my subject matter, but this document uh, really um, struck me as something that um, corroborated uh, my hypothesis. Um, my hypothesis was that something very interesting uh, happened um, in the Gulag, in the correction colonies of the Brezhnev time, um, something that brought together Jewish and Ukrainian inmates and uh, created certain environment in which they um, exchanged ideas, um, rubbed shoulders, uh, broke bread, uh, established friendships that lasted for many years and that to some uh, extent shaped uh, the um, Ukrainian Jewish relations um, in the independent Ukraine after 1991. Um, what is this something I didn't know, but that something happened in the camps um, I did know. And here is the document uh, that really struck me when I uh, looked at it. It is the complaint 
of the uh, Ukrainian KGB um, uh, of uh, at the time it is, um, uh, I believe, Nikitchenko, um, who is uh, writing this document uh, to uh, uh, Shellist and then to Sherbitsky um, uh, when Shellist is removed from power. And uh, the head of the KGB is complaining first and foremost to, the, uh, uh, to his bosses in Moscow um, about uh, the um, incomprehensible um, and um, very much unlikely situation that happened um, in uh, the Moridovian concentration camps. He writes, the conditions of the inmates foster their active work as the enemies of Soviet power engaged in the creation of a nationalist grouping and influencing the inmates who chose the path of correction. As they can freely communicate, they elaborate shared tactics of behavior, challenge the prosecution, change the depositions, insist on the cancellation of the verdicts, analyze the reasons for arrests, the course of prosecution and trial, and are able to advance conclusions about the failures of their groupings, and they can identify the informers, decipher letter type, literneia, and other operating measures. I will um, um, comment uh, what is uh, meant here at the end of the uh, statement uh, in three and a half minutes. So what this document stipulates, it's, uh, um, this is uh, what, what you read here, uh, what I read for you is just um, a brief excerpt from this document. It's a lengthy document, it has three um, uh, pages um, uh, on a typewriter. And the document actually says that uh, instead of um, distributing um, the uh, dissidents uh, accused of anti-Soviet activity, um, throughout uh, the uh, territory of uh, the Soviet Union and send one to, uh, let's say, uh, Blagoveshensk and another to uh, Irkutsk and the third to Krasnoyarsk and the third to, to Vorkuta and the fourth to Perm. Um, for some reasons, um, Ukrainian inmates uh, were concentrated in uh, basically three um, uh, Pirim-based uh, 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 Mordovia camps um, uh, in uh, the northern part uh, of, uh, of the Russian Federation. And they established there the clubs. Um, they um, exchange their ideas. Whatever is written here um, uh, is um, uh, not just an invention of KGB. Uh, this is something that the Ukrainian KGB uh, received in forms of complaints and um, internal uh, information uh, from the um, uh, heads of this um, uh, correction colonies who are saying, uh, who, who are telling the Ukrainian KGB how this uh, Ukrainian inmates are, are behaving. Um, so uh, this document says, um, what, what is going on with you guys in Moscow? Do you not understand that you have to distribute those Ukrainian inmates so that they would not, you know, be together? Um, of course, uh, the most threatening thing here is at the end of, um, of the um, of the discussion uh, when they say uh, that uh, these people uh, exchange information about uh, how their prosecution uh, um, uh, was uh, moving on. So uh, they understand uh, the way the KGB um, influences uh, uh, the courts. Uh, they also um, advance conclusions about the failures of their groupings, So, which means that they can identify who is the informer talking to one another. Um, and of course, uh, they decipher a letter type, literne uh, dila. Uh, these are um, specially prepared uh, cases. Uh, in most cases, these are bogus cases. So um, uh, they um, concern the groups that do not exist. Um, uh, the KGB uh, uh, names a case, for example, the block. And they say, we will uh, we'll, uh, work on the block case. Block case means that they bring together uh, in this case, um, scattered uh, groups of people or, or just individuals uh, from uh, Ivano-Frankivsk, uh, Chernivtsi, Odessa, Zhitomir, Kharkiv, Kiev, uh, Lviv, uh, people who might not know one another. Uh, but KGB um, receives um, promotion, KGB officers receive promotions and their um, um, uh, chiefs uh, receive orders and awards from the state if they if they uh, reveal um, a group, uh, that the, there is um, a kind of a clandestine group. So they do need these groups, not just individuals. And how they do the groups, they invent this literne uh, 
um, cases um, that they uh, call by letters or you know by a word like the letter B or uh, uh, the uh, the word block case. Then they bring these people together and they say, oh, these people are connected with one another. They share in the, uh, some is that uh, the the um, uh, illegally published um, um, uh, works uh, by major dissidents and. Uh, uh, the group is created, and this group then is presented uh, to the KGB officials. Uh, that then, uh, after which um, uh, the officials uh, move uh, the case uh, to the court, and uh, then the uh, entire group is brought together. Um, of course. Uh, brought to trial in different towns, but presented as one group. So this is what they mean by um, uh, literary uh, cases. And uh, uh, also something interesting in this document, uh, they mean uh, that um, uh, other operating measures um, um, are revealed uh, during the conversations between inmates. What are these operating measures? Operative uh, um, um, usually in, in, usually implies the informers uh, that are um, uh, operating uh, as moles uh, within the groups of uh, dissidents or human rights activists, and that are uh, kind of implanted informers uh, uh, that, that constantly um, uh, send uh, their uh, reports uh, to uh, the KGB saying what is going on uh, in this or that milieu. Um, of the intelligentsia. So this is what this document is about. But uh, again, or if we look at this document closely, we will realize that um, it is kind of a voice um, of the crying is in the desert uh, because uh, the head of the KGB is, year, is, is, is really um, outraged by uh, the uh, blindness of uh, uh, his Moscow um, uh, colleagues. And, um, and of course, uh, they are expecting um, in Kiev some sort of a feedback. This feedback never comes. Moreover, again, for the reason that I cannot explain, maybe somebody could help me to explain this reason, uh, no actions um, are, uh, uh, the, the Moscow KGB um, does not follow this complaint with, with any kind of actions. So the dissidents uh, who were placed mostly in Mordovia camps continued to be placed in Mordovia camps, uh, three, four, five uh, correction colonies. Um, uh, I call them sometimes camps, sometimes, uh, you know, uh, by camps, I mean uh, this German word lager. Um, the word ligated, which, which was um, used um, among the uh, inmates um, uh, of uh, different ethnicities in the Soviet Union. Uh, of course, the official English term is um, the um, correction colony, right? The word gulag continues to exist, although it is not a Stalin gulag. Uh, these are not concentration camps. These are correction colonies, as they were called in the Brezhnev time. Now, if we look at what is going on in this correction colonies, we will see that uh, the KGB document tells only half of what they wanted to say. Um, on my uh, right-hand side, um, I place the portraits of people who are uh, basically spending time in one of the same correction colony uh, from um, uh, up to bottom. Uh, Zinovi Antonyuk, uh, Vasil Stus, Yevhen um, Sverstyuk, um, uh, Chernovol, um, uh, uh, Zinovi Popadyuk. Uh, these are people who spend time in one of the same correction colonies or correction colony. Of course, people are moved uh, in and out. Uh, there are many more other uh, Ukrainian dissidents uh, that are uh, spending time rubbing shoulders together in one of the same correction colonies. We are talking about dozens maybe hundreds of people uh, who come to know one another um, in the correction colonies. But what is amazing is that um, at the same time, uh, the uh, Zionist-minded uh, activists uh, of Jewish descent, of course, or uh, let's say uh, the uh, human rights um, activists uh, involved uh, with the democratic uh, Soviet um, uh, underground of human rights activists also were sent to the correction colonies. And it is amazing that they were sent to the same correction colonies. So uh, uh, from um, uh, bottom up, 
uh, uh, Mendelevich, uh, Penson, uh, Zissels, Heifetz, Wutka. Uh, and again, we are talking about dozens of other people uh, who um, found themselves uh, in one of the same correction company. And um, what the KGB document that I read to you uh, uh, stipulates, but does not put uh, black and white, is that these people, uh, my left-hand side and my right-hand side, let's say, um, uh, people of Jewish descent, inmates of Jewish descent, and inmates of Ukrainian descent started to talk to one another. Now, when I'm saying the dissidents, um, meaning uh, these people, I mean a very broad group uh, of um, inmates. Uh, among them, there are human rights activists um, as Zissers. Um, uh, there are Zionists um, and refuseniks, uh, such as uh, Pinson. Uh, there are dissidents um, uh, who are poets, writers, and artists, for example, Heifetz uh, of Asil Stus. Uh, they are, uh, you know, second, um, second uh, from the top uh, here and there. Um, uh, so uh, we are talking about representatives of the National Democratic Intelligentsia. Some, uh, uh, there are people among them who are um, uh, staunch nationalists on both sides. There are people who are, you know, the national democratic, even liberal um, uh, conviction, uh, but uh, because of uh, um, the fact that they distributed um, uh, some is that, uh, or they were caught um, uh, uh, during um, uh, protest demonstrations, or they were um, attacking um, the Soviet um, uh, authorities, different levels of authorities with um, uh, complaints and requests uh, to be uh, to be let out of the country because of that they ended up um, within the group of people that the Soviet um, uh, authorities considered um, anti-Soviet minded anti-Sovietchiki and they were uh, 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 convicted and received different terms for what is known uh, to be as anti-Soviet activity um, anywhere from uh, four minimum to eight years in a correction colony, and then uh, five to seven years um, of what is called Pasilenia uh, or Sote Kilometer. Uh, the, these people were not allowed to um, live uh, in big cities um, and had to settle 100 kilometers outside of the city uh, for, seven, uh, for, for five or seven years. So we are talking today about these groups of Jews and of Ukrainians who started to talk to one another in the correction colonies. And when I'm looking at their faces and when I'm discussing uh, uh, these two uh, in, uh, groups of individuals, I'm asking myself a question. Both groups, of course, speak Russian language. Why they do not talk to the Russian language inmates uh, who are, um, the Russian dissidents, uh, wh why do they necessarily have to talk to one another, those Jews and those Ukrainians? And I'll answer this question uh, looking first um, at the results of my uh, oral interviews that I conducted with a number of uh, people who I just showed to you, um, who are thinking out loud, maybe for the first time, because nobody has ever asked them this question, as it turned out, why do they do not talk to the, uh, uh, to the uh, Russians? Why do they talk to necessarily minority representatives? In many cases, to Armenians, Estonians, um, uh, less to uh, Latvians, but very often to Ukrainians and Jews. Why these two groups? Zoran, Zorian Popadyuk, uh, who was arrested for uh, uh, Ukrainian um, underground uh, activities when he was a uh, very young um, uh, Lviv-based uh, student, says, when you talk about the Russians, they had their own imperial ideology. And if they felt that you are not following them, that meaning that you are not kowtowing to the imperial ideology, they would distance from you. And he brings an example that Evgeny Vagin, the founder of the All Russian Christian Union Liberation of the People, and a very prominent uh, Russian dissident who was with him in the same uh, correction colony, read my verdict, I quote, and said that all those people who I was close with, Zuba and others, and of course, um, he listed uh, Ukrainians, Ukrainian nationalists, all of them were Jews. Um, uh, Popaduk says, I was shocked and never approached him again. 
Russian monarchists, he says, thought the Jews destroyed the empire. So um, according to Popadyuk, um, he is not going to talk to the Russian dissidents because they are, uh, uh, many of them are monarchists, many of them are uh, staunch um, Orthodox Christians, and uh, they dream of the reestablishment of the, of the Russian empire. Um, Miroslav Marinovich, um, a very uh, well-known um, uh, dissident um, and um, human rights activist, uh, the member of uh, um, Helsinki Group, um, you know, who uh, spent uh, more than eight years in a correction colony, uh, was um, at least twice convicted. He says, many Russian inmates were different from us, he means Ukrainians, because they had imperial paradigm in their mentality. They considered national minorities a threat for the Russian state security. Uh, one of them, Yevdokimov, told me that Agorodnikov rebuked him Yevdokimov, for befriending inmates of national minorities. So what he was trying to say is that there were, of course, different Russians. He does not want to create kind of a stereotype. Um, um, there was, um, so um, uh, Marinovich was close with um, a Democrat Yevdokimov, but he was not close with um, a monarchist Agorodnikov um, uh, because uh, Agorodnikov was, uh, you know, asking why you Russian inmates are befriending those uh, Ukrainians or those Jews. Uh, they are destroying Russian state security. A uh, very interesting observation um, uh, shared with me um, Arthur Fredekind, uh, who was uh, very late to, be, to get a correction colony. He was... Um, um, sentenced already in the 1980s, um, and he was of German and Jewish descent, um, an interesting combination. Um, so he told me something different. Unlike, uh, uh, you know, uh, big name uh, dissidents, uh, Fredekind, um, also a young man at that time when he was sentenced, um, found himself in Moridovian camps, but uh, mostly among uh, the uh, people who were not of, um, uh, who, who, who did not come from uh, big cities, who were not from uh, the media of intelligentsia. And he also adds to my vision, why not Russians? Uh, and he says something um, uh, which I found uh, insightful and interesting. He says, people who knew that I was uh, for the independence of Ukraine, that I kind of stood for the independence of Ukraine, that I defended um, the idea of Ukrainian independence in the 1980s, they momentarily changed the attitude to me. Russians in the majority thought that they are in prison, uh, that to live badly is, uh, is their fate, uh, that they cannot change anything. However, among the ethnic minorities, especially Armenians, Armenians Georgians, um, um, and Ukrainians, we, those representatives of, of ethnic minorities understood that we were captured by an alien power that made us into who we are, and therefore we can change things. So this um, fatalism uh, of, um, uh, of the Russian inmates and uh, the desire to do things and to change things um, um, when, uh, it, uh, when the conversation was with um, the representatives of ethnic minorities really uh, uh, changed the way uh, the interaction uh, in the camp between different groups of people uh, uh, worked. Now, uh, having said that, I need to, to mention that, uh, of course, uh, this is um, um, based on several interviews, um, and um, I also uh, read in, in a number of memoirs that the situation was far uh, more complex, but uh, these insights at least uh, give us the idea why do Ukrainians and Jews uh, prefer to talk to one another? Another thing is purely statistical. I don't have statistics today in my presentation, but I do have them elsewhere. Um, it turns out uh, that um, in any correction colony in Moldovia, uh, about 50% of uh, uh, people who came from uh, you know, big cities and who belonged to this to that extent to the media of intelligentsia, about 50% were Ukrainians. Um, and, um, uh, Jews were, of course, uh, in minority, but when you are looking who to talk to, people who are surrounding you from all sides are Ukrainian inmates, among whom there are people who um, continue to uh, the, the term, 25-year term, um, as uh, the activists in Ukrainian um, underground uh, who fought 
um, against the Soviet power uh, with arms in their hands uh, from uh, um, 1941 till 1948. Uh, there are representatives of Ukrainian democratic movement, um, uh, also the um, human rights activists, and also uh, staunch Ukrainian um, nationalists uh, who, uh, who were um, uh, distributing uh, anti-Soviet leaflets um, um, in, in big cities. So the Jews found themselves surrounded by that mass of Ukrainians. So it was, um, oh, from a certain perspective, uh, normative to talk to, the, um, um, uh, to, talk to the, uh, Ukrainian inmates. Now, another question I'm asking myself, where did they talk? Because of course, um, uh, anybody who studies uh, the um, correction colonies knows that there was um, an MVD, a Minister of Interior uh, prohibition um, of uh, the inmates from bar one barrack to go to other barracks. Um, uh, that is uh, something that uh, was um, kind of carved in stone. And if you are caught uh, in uh, the barrack uh, that is not yours, uh, you will be um, uh, sentenced to uh, uh, to cold chamber, to carcer, or uh, there were uh, all sorts of other punishments. Uh, for example, they could um, rescind you from uh, the uh, opportunity to get um, uh, the uh, parcel from home with food or to buy um, additional food uh, in the local kiosk. So if you cannot go to the barracks where other people are and you have to stay with uh, 30, 40 people only in your barrack, where do people talk? So of course, um, uh, the meals, um, in um, the Soviet correction colonies were organized not like they are organized in the American prison, for example, where do you have fixed sitting? So uh, they show you where you sit and you sit there um, uh, for the entire term in, in many, uh, uh, maybe in most cases. There were no fixed seating. So you could choose who you sit next to and who you would like to talk to. Um, most of inmates worked. And they did very tedious work. Uh, some of them were producing um, um, uh, the, the belt uh, buckles. Uh, others were producing uh, the um, boxes uh, for tomatoes and cucumbers. Um, uh, others were producing um, uh, different types of footwear. Um, the work was uh, dull, extremely tedious. And uh, very few people were really trying to do all of that. Uh, most were just working because they had to work. Of course, it is forced labor. So uh, when it is forced labor, uh, people do not really want to do work. During long breaks where they did not have anything to do, people talk to one another. There were also, quite interestingly, the so-called Lenin's rooms. Those who are familiar with uh, the Soviet Union know that in every school, in, even in every kindergarten, um, and of course, uh, uh, at many um, uh, higher educational establishments, there was so-called Lenin's room or red corner, where they would put, instead of icons, the portraits of the members of Politburo, uh, the portrait of Lenin. Um, and in correction colonies, there was a special room that was called Lenin's room. Oh, with the newspapers, uh, Pravda Trud, Komsomorska uh, Znamia, uh, and others uh, that people uh, necessarily had to read, um, uh, the um, brochures um, uh, about the um, internal structure and behavior um, um, of the inmates, and many other propaganda materials. That was in the Lenin's room. So uh, the informers did not go to Lenin's room, and the dissidents. Um, uh, um, uh, really found uh, Lenin's room kind of a cozy uh, environment where they could sit together and talk. But of course, most important uh, way to discuss uh, big things was outdoors, where nobody intercepts the conversation, where you are not uh, afraid of stool pigeons uh, who will report you to uh, the um, correction colony authorities. Um, in each and every camp, uh, the paths uh, those um, uh, outdoor um, uh, itineraries uh, had their own names. Uh, in one correction colony, it was called the Ho Chi Minh Path. In another, it was called the Circle Path. In the third, it was called the Orbit Path. Um, so the, the inmates were just going outside and uh, they were walking around uh, um, uh, the um, 
of course, internally within, uh, they were surrounded by uh, by a barbed wire and by a fence, um, uh, but they could walk um, uh, freely. And um, uh, one of them is claimed that uh, some correction colonies were so big that one can one could walk several hundred meters without seeing a fence, uh, which really created um, a, a sense of uh, kind of internal freedom, freedom within prison. So. Um, most conversations um, that uh, became part and parcel of uh, the books that I'll be discussing in five minutes uh, were um, conducted during these um, walks. Uh, in most cases, two people would uh, walk with, uh, uh, with an uh, one person would walk with an interlocutor, uh, three would um, create a um, uh, kind of a suspicion uh, among the supervisors and um, uh, of course, uh, walks were usually, uh, you know, with just with one interlocutor, uh, not to trigger uh, the indignation of the supervisors. Now, uh, when I am talk when I am discussing uh, uh, Ukrainians and Jews who started to talk to one another um, in the correction colonies, uh, of course, uh, I am looking um, at what happened. Uh, in this different dissident um, uh, 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 milieu uh, before, uh, let's say, um, uh, Heifetz uh, or Penson uh, or Mendelevich uh, uh, on the one hand, or Marinovich, Popaduk, um, um, and Stus on the other hand, uh, before they, they, they were convicted and they received their terms in prison. Do they talk to one another? Well, I do have examples uh, of uh, several prominent dissidents uh, uh, such as uh, Zuba, such as Plush, uh, who are um, functioning as liaisons uh, between different groups of uh, dissidents uh, in Ukraine. But in most cases, we are talking about what Howard M. Astor and Peter Potichny uh, in their book uh, on Ukrainian Jewish relations called Two Solitudes. We really um, do not see much of the interaction. Uh, um, I gave uh, my uh, lecture on um, uh, Zuba's uh, talk um, in um, September in 1966 uh, at the Babin Yar site during the 25th commemoration, 25th anniversary um, of the Babin Yar massacre. Um, um, and and uh, uh, my talk was published in uh, the German uh, version in um, uh, Osteuropa. Um, um, take a look at it um, uh, if you have a chance. Um, uh, so this is of course um, uh, an outstanding uh, example uh, of a person who reaches out uh, from the Ukrainian side to the Jews. Um, um, I also mentioned in this article uh, that Plush kind of continued to do what Zuba started. Uh, but um, beyond three, four, five uh, cases uh, of uh, that kind of an interaction, um, we do have some interaction between uh, Ukrainians and Jews in the general democratic um, human rights movement um, uh, uh, media already in the mid 1970s, and of course after the um, uh, the, um, uh, the 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 moment when Soviet Union put its signature um, under the um, document on uh, the human rights, the so-called Helsinki Agreement, then we have. Um, some sort of an interaction uh, within the democratic media, uh, but in the democratic media, nobody asks who you are. Uh, you know, you are of democratic convictions and you work uh, within the human rights um, um, uh, patterns. Uh, however, we do not see, uh, for example, Zionists in the um, Ukrainian or all union underground uh, who are talking to the representatives of other um, ethnic minorities. You know, Zionists, Refuseniks, uh, they are uh, fighting for the permission to leave the Soviet Union. They are not interested in um, um, doing things together with the Ukrainians. And Ukrainians are interested in uh, singing their kolatki, uh, their um, um, New Year carols, um, in uh, celebrating Shevchenko's birthday, um, in uh, distributing uh, uh, leaflets um, uh, and um, um, the, uh, in most cases, poems and memoirs uh, written behind the barbed wire. So um, uh, there is kind of cultural work um, among Ukrainian dissidents and cultural work among the Zionists. And these two spheres do not, um, uh, do not intersect. All of that changes once uh, the um, 
the representatives of both groups find themselves um, behind the barbed wire. I would like to discuss uh, a number of uh, case studies uh, that will uh, show us what actually and how actually things happen behind the barbed wire. But I would like to start uh, with something that again brings us um, uh, kind of behind the bars, uh, although let's say in the Soviet Union, everything that is happening is, is uh, behind the bars. Um, uh, I would like to uh, briefly mention um, a, um, a very interesting case. Uh, hold on a second, somebody is trying to say something. No, okay. Uh, 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 very interesting case of um, uh, Svetoslav Karavansky, uh, who is a staunch Ukrainian nationalist. He fights uh, the Soviets um, uh, during the Second World War. Um, uh, he is uh, sentenced to 25 years in, um, in a correction colony. He is rehabilitated in the 1950s, uh, is released. Um, and um, when he starts his, his uh, dissident activity, um, uh, they tell him, um, look, we um, ask you to spend 25 years behind bars. So please go back and, and spend the rest of your term. Um, uh, he spends uh, more than 20 years uh, behind bars in the Soviet Union. And um, when he is released, and also when he is in prison, uh, Svetoslav Karavansky creates a number of outstanding um, uh, books uh, that have uh, quite an impact uh, in Ukrainian philology. He creates the, the uh, Dictionary of Ukrainian Rhymes. He's, uh, he's a very talented philo philologist. Um, he's creating um, um, a number of other uh, dictionaries um, um, of, U of the Ukrainian language. Um, and um, he is quite prolific in uh, different spheres, but he starts his um, career kind of in the dissident movement with a very interesting document. In, um, uh, on April uh, 10th, 1966, so half a year before Dzuba uh, uh, comes to talk to the Jews in the Baden Yar, uh, Svetoslav Karavansky in Odessa um, writes a complaint uh, to the head of the Supreme Council of the Ukrainian um, Soviet Socialist Republic saying that um, the Ukrainian authorities do whatever they can in order to um, promote assimilation and uh, uh, really um, curb whatever Ukrainian uh, uh, revivalist um, um, elements uh, can make their way into Ukrainian education, Ukrainian culture. Um, uh, he basically says uh, that uh, in the Soviet Union, Ukrainians cannot get their education in the Ukrainian language, and there is no decent Ukrainian education in Ukraine to begin with. So um, the same thing we see, for example, in the famous work by Zuba, um, uh, Internationalism and Chirosifikatsia, Internationalism and Orosification. And um, uh, what um, Karavansky is saying in his complaint is um, kind of a talk of a town uh, among the dissidents. However, what is not the talk of the town is how Karavansky starts his letter. And he starts his letter not by discussing uh, the um, Ukrainian situation, but by discussing the Jewish situation. He says, above all, let me draw your attention to the discrimination of the Jewish population. The closure of Jewish cultural institutions, newspapers, schools, theaters, publishing houses, the shooting of Jewish cultural figures, the discrimination of Jewish um, ad um, admissions to secondary and higher educational establishments, all these phenomena freely blossomed under Stalin's cult of personality. It seemed that the denunciation of the cult of personality should have put an end to these forms of discrimination. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. And on and on and on, he goes uh, to discuss what actually um, a uh, person of Jewish descent has to face uh, when he or she is trying to get to a higher education uh, establishment um, and how this all triggers the rise of uh, uh, Zionism uh, among the youth. So um, Karawanski is very carefully using the Soviet uh, uh, official propaganda language to say, you folks do whatever you can um, uh, in order to push those Jews um, into Zionist activity uh, in the underground because you do not let them um, uh, get the higher educational establishment uh, uh, that they seek. Um, that is something extraordinary. Uh, so uh, a person of Ukrainian descent, again, uh, of, uh, I would say, uh, staunch nationalist uh, convictions, 
is discussing Jews and Ukrainians um, as victims of the Soviet enforced assimilation. Um, and uh, of course, uh, uh, he had to pay dearly for this letter. Just for this letter, uh, he was um, uh, arrested and sentenced again. Uh, I believe uh, he received seven years of correction colony. Um, uh, and, um, and there in, in prison, uh, in, in correction, first in prison and then in correction colony, he encountered uh, the Jews uh, whose rights uh, he was defending in his letter. So this is, I'm just giving you one of the examples, one of the rare examples of Jews and Ukrainians um, who are caring about one another and who talk to one another or about one another before they get to prison. Um, when they actually get to the correction colony, the situation, as I mentioned, changed radically. They start not only talking to one another, they start writing about one another. Um, 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 Yuri Vutka, from, uh, originally from Dnepropetrovsk, um, is a very much um, assimilated into the Russian language and Russian milieu um, uh, uh, Jewish student. Um, he is um, arrested for um, his... Um, uh, pro-Zionist activities. Um, and uh, he finds himself um, a very young man, I believe he is um, hardly 20, in a Soviet correction colony. And what he does there, he starts talking to Ukrainian inmates. He discovers the, um, uh, uh, the entire spectrum of uh, Ukrainian underground um, uh, sentence, uh, representatives, excuse me, of Ukrainian underground sentenced to different terms in um, the correction colonies. And he writes about these people uh, with great sympathy. Um, or whatever he writes, um, he starts with, uh, he starts writing in, in the Russian language, but whatever he writes and whatever he publishes is momentarily translated into the Ukrainian language and published um, um, uh, first um, uh, abroad and then in Ukraine in the Ukrainian language. So what he says becomes part of the uh, Ukrainian um, um, uh, cultural um, uh, milieu. He says, um, um, talking about his uh, new friend, Yevhen Sverstyuk, Ukrainian uh, uh, journalist, um, uh, writer, um, and thinker. But even in the midst of the feral, degenerate, and hostile invaders, uh, the boy, he talks about, young Sverstyuk, managed to preserve the purity of his soul and the wings of its aspirations. This soul did not go as a janissary to the demon's power, but devoted itself to serving his nation, rent asunder, and to the universal beauty. Yevhen, Yevhen Sverstyuk, had neither tanks nor planes at his disposal. All he had was a pure soul, brilliant intelligence, and a good word. It was precisely for using this type of weapon that the enemy arrested him for his uh, uh, wife, um, his mother and his son, and cast him into the places where socialism is built a la Dante. The Sverstuk model is clear cut proof that there is no other path to universal achievements but the national one. It is only through the national that one can proceed to the universal. If the hopes and torments of your kinsmen, if the rape and murder of the body and the soul of your people do not disturb you, do not elicit a natural response, then what can you possibly say to the rest of the humanity? So it is amazing that this is a Jewish boy discovering the um, Ukrainian national democrat uh, who becomes his interlocutor is writing about him, is creating his image in his writing, and is publishing um, oh, his memoirs talking about his Ukrainian interlocutors who actually triggered his own Aryavutka interest in religion, in um, more serious attachment to his land, and in uh, the human rights um, activity. So the conversations that these people have with one another uh, are not just conversations. They are building the characters. They are building the individu individualities. And uh, some of these conversations have long lasting impact. Let me bring uh, the example of um, uh, one of the most famous um, uh, um, inmates uh, among these Mordovia camp uh, inmates who is um, not a Ukrainian Jew, he is a 100% assimilated um, Russian uh, Jew who lives in um, uh, Leningrad, 
um, and um, who is um, a literary scholar, a very talented literary scholar, uh, well-equipped, uh, well-trained, and um, he is asked um, after the uh, expulsion of uh, Yosef Brodsky to write a um, preface to the first clandestine publication of Brodsky, to the first, uh, I would say, Samizdat collection of Brodsky's poetry. And he does that. And he receives for his um, um, Samizdat publication, um, um, uh, I believe, eight years of uh, correction colony. His name is uh, Mikhail Heifetz. And when Mikhail Heifetz um, uh, is sent to the Mordovia camp, um, he finds himself surrounded by uh, Ukrainian inmates. One of them, who I already mentioned, Zoran Popadyuk, tells him, you know what, uh, we are, of course, um, journalists, we are, you know, uh, university students, um, or, or, you know, we already started our careers um, in uh, different fields. Um, uh, but actually, there is one person who is a genius, and you need to get to know him. And this person is Vasil Stus perhaps one of the two maximum three uh, most important Ukrainian poets um, of the second half of the 20th century. And lo and behold, it happens that Stus is transferred to the colony uh, where Heifetz um, uh, spends his term. And Heifetz is doing something that um, I found uh, really groundbreaking. He starts teaching himself Ukrainian language in order to get to understand the poetry of Vasil Stus. Um, and um, once he understands what kind of poet is in front of him, he starts recording everything, every conversation that he has with Stus. And um, since uh, uh, Heifetz spent with Stus more time than anybody else in the correction colony, uh, the lengthy memoirs of uh, Heifetz about Stus are today kind of a sine qua non um, of um, any um, bibliography on Stus and uh, uh, Heifetz's um, insights into Stus are quoted by anybody who writes about this um, major Ukrainian poet. Um, so um, this is uh, one of the excerpts uh, from uh, a very interesting book uh, by Mikhail Heifetz, uh, Ukrainske Silhouette, which had been um, clandestine, in a clandestine manner transferred uh, to the West, uh, first uh, to Israel and then to Munich, and then published um, in uh, Munich uh, less, than half, less than a year after um, uh, the uh, document, uh, the, 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 um, the book was smuggled from the correction colony. So Heifetz writes, Making rounds of that circle once and again, remember I told you about circles that people were walking on these uh, paths within the correction colony. Zorian Papaduk educated me regarding the wonderful cadres of the Ukrainian people who filled in 1975 the renowned Moridovia. He means, of course, the Moridovia correction colonies. Frankly, the key proof of the human um, exclusivity of the representatives of that nation, according to the young Ukrainian, uh, were the enormous incarceration terms. So why are you dealing, um, says Popaduk um, uh, to uh, Heifetz with uh, wonderful people? Look how long the terms that they got. Within the barbed wire square, it became clear to both of us that if a person has a long term, he's a dignifying person, while a shorter term made one thing of some sort of a blemish. Still, this was just a theory. I have not met people with short terms. We understood that there could be exceptions, yet the young Zurian was convinced the Soviet power would not give less to a good person. The longest terms in the correction colonies are by us, the Ukrainians. He said modestly, yet with a clearly palpable conce and concealed pride. So um, uh, Heifetz, um, due to the Ukrainians that surround him, discovers uh, wonderful uh, people. Of course, he was thinking that all Ukrainian nationalists are Banderites and they are Jew killers and they are Jew haters, and he finds human beings uh, who are Ukrainian nationalists, but who are not Jewish, who are not Jew haters, and, and, and uh, who are not, uh, you know, uh, uh, willing to uh, uh, kill whoever doesn't agree with them. Uh, they are, uh, you know, of uh, national democratic 
uh, convictions, and they are the most important and the most interesting interlocutors. And Heifetz starts developing his um, um, uh, network among these people and writing about them. So uh, his book, Ukrainski um, uh, Silhouette, published in, uh, in Munich, uh, for the first time and then reprinted many times uh, in Ukraine um, uh, really um, is um, an amazing document uh, that tells you um, about people uh, who did not have anybody else to who they could confess and to who they could um, tell their stories. Um, uh, my um, uh, last example um, of that sort um, is kind of, um, I would say, reverse impact. So here you are, um, Ukrainians um, talk to the Jews, and at a certain point, um, okay, um, I'm asked to, uh, to roll my conversation. Uh, so um, um, I would like to, um, to, to finish uh, quickly um, uh, that part uh, of, of my talk and we'll get to, to the questions. Um, um, at certain point, uh, the Jews who are celebrating uh, different holidays, including the establishment of the state of Israel, um, they are getting to the Ukrainian friends and saying, can you write something about that event? Does it mean anything? to you. And Yvonne Skvostuk, who I mentioned um, uh, already several times, um, is writing in Correction Colony, in Mordovia, in Correction Colony, uh, the famous uh, document of about 12 pages, The Grains of Ukrainian-Israeli Solidarity, for the first time outlining um, uh, um, the um, new connections, new networks, and new type of uh, relations, not just with individual Jews. Uh, he sees Ukrainians as the representatives of the would-be independent Ukraine and Jews as the representatives of the, would -be, uh, of, of the Israel state. Uh, so he is um, talking about political identities uh, of, uh, of course, of Jews who are in the correction colonies. They are Soviet assimilated Jews. They, have, they do not know whether they would have ever, ever a chance to, uh, to get to Israel. And he discusses Ukrainians who are also in the correction colony and uh, nobody knows if they, have, uh, if they would ever have a chance to live in the independent Ukraine. Still, he discusses this kind of very interesting encounter looking at the two political identities and discussing the, uh, the um, prison uh, and, and the correction colonies as the meeting place of Ukrainians and Jews in the, in, in the camps. Um, what I would like, what I wanted to discuss uh, further um, um, I'm at that point asking um, a question of uh, how important are these um, uh, different um, uh, memoirs and uh, what they create. And I look at these memoirs first and foremost as at literature. Of course, they are historical documents, but they are also um, very important uh, literary works. And uh, if we look at what is produced in Ukraine in the 1970s, early 1980s, um, in the, um, uh, uh, let's say, under the auspices of Ukrainian officialdom, I would say that the most interesting things are produced by the translators who publish things in the Sesvit journal. Um, and these are, again, translations into Ukrainian language from um, other languages. And uh, this, this is kind of an official um, existence of Ukrainian literature. And on the other hand, we have these multiple works by um, uh, Ukrainians and Jews who create the images of one another um, in the uh, correction colonies and outside it. Uh, and at a certain point, I'm asking a question of how these things are structured um, and why. Um, and um, I trace a parallel between uh, the way these um, books are structured, and of course, um, uh, something that all these people read, um, uh, the um, famous novel by Dostoevsky, Zapiski's Myrtle Doma, um, and I'm showing to what extent um, uh, these books uh, were ubiquitous, and, and I'm discussing how Dostoevsky shaped uh, the uh, mentality of those who were writing their books. Uh, the only thing that I am, um, of course, um, uh, showing uh, which which is different uh, uh, in these books uh, and in that book um, is that uh, Zapiski's Mortal Doma, uh, the notes um, uh, from the Dead House by Dostoevsky, um, uh, is um, uh, permeated 
uh, by xenophobia, racist bias, and, and anti-Semitism. Uh, Dostoevsky is all the time uh, showing his aversion to Catholic Poles, um, uh, Jew, and the only Jew who is there um, uh, with him uh, in the Ostrog, in this uh, correction colony, uh, so to say, in Siberia in the 1850s, in the 1840s, um, and sometimes to uh, also to Tatars. Um, unlike Dostoevsky, um, uh, the authors of these books um, are um, trying uh, to express their sympathy and to create positive image of Catholic Poles, Tatars, Muslims, and especially Jews, breaking the stereotypes. So all these books are creating a brand new image of a Jew for Ukrainians and of the Ukrainians for the Jews um, that um, really shatters um, every type of the stereotype that exists at that time um, um, in the wide milieu of people who read books and who read, um, uh, you know, also some of this stuff. Um, I will stop here. Um, I have other things to say, uh, but um, I understand that we are running out of time. And of course, um, uh, those who are with us, uh, who tolerated me for more than 50 minutes, uh, they would like to ask questions. So I would be uh, more than happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you very much for such an insightful talk. I think maybe uh, you can stop sharing the screen or you, can... you know, let me not stop sharing the screen. Okay. Uh, do you see, do you, 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 do you continue seeing my screen, right? Yeah, yeah, the presentation in the PowerPoint, yeah. Uh, you know what? I might need something from there, so. Uh... Okay. So uh, if anyone has a question, you can raise a hand or, or write it in, in the chat and I will read it out loud. Andrea, I'm, I'm sure you have questions. So why don't, why, why don't you uh, start asking uh, and uh, others will join. Uh, yeah, D dear colleagues, first of all, I want to say that today we have like a special, let's say at least, uh, let's say technical, technically organized special event because uh, yeah, we don't see each other all the time. So uh, uh, yeah, oh, we, we, we have many questions, dear Johanan. You see, okay. so maybe I'll just uh, I'll just uh, mention one uh, aspect. I was it was very important for me actually that you mentioned Arthur Fredekin, who is a good friend of mine, hmm. also one of heroes of my Dnipro book because he is from Dnipro Petrovsk, right. of Yeah, and this incredible story uh, behind it. So maybe maybe just to start, and then my colleagues will continue, maybe you could just tell us, because I'm kind of curious, like how many of those, no, let's say, interviews or personal, you know, discussions or whatever have you done? And what was maybe, how to put it, let's say, what amazed you the most? What was the most say, unexpected story you've heard from those people who spent some time in the Gulag? Thank you. Uh, look, um, I don't think my interviews uh, would be more insightful than the published works. What I'm trying to get from my interviews is um, something that is not in the works published. So, so when I'm coming to talk to Papa Duke, uh, Fredeki and Zisils, Marinovich and others. Um, and I do not have many interviews. I have like a dozen. And I just started to work on, on this side too late because, you know, Antoniuk is no more there. Svirstuk, uh, the neighbor of my parents is no more there. And people, you know, people die as I'm, as I'm presenting this thing. Uh, I was in conversation with uh, Karavansky for many years, but we never actually had a um, a talk about something that interests me now. So what I'm asking these people is uh, quite unorthodox. I'm asking basically four questions, five questions. First, where did they talk? Where were these places of conversation? Second, I'm asking um, what are the most important conversations? So name me three important conversations that you had uh, over the entire term, with who, where, under what circumstances, and what was the, the topic. Third, um, what was the most important lesson, one of the first lessons that you got from the people from the, you know, who, who are not of your milieu, from somebody else in, in the colony. 
fourth, um, I'm, I'm asking, um, yeah, I'm asking all the time uh, that particular question. Um, you know, in your um, published work, you are all the time talking about Ukrainians. For example, if I'm talking to a person of Jewish uh, descent, or uh, as in the case of Frederick and Jewish German descent, um, why are you talking to these people? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm interested to substantiate what I have to say by asking these people why, why, are not, why they are not talking to the Russians. I'm asking this question all the time because that is, that is a normal question for me. Of course, Russian inmates are much better educated. Of course, people from Leningrad and Moscow are um, uh, uh, much better equipped to talk about uh, history, philosophy, um, you know, and, and, and you do see that. But these people have something that uh, is not satisfying, is, is not satisfying either Jews or Ukrainians. And I'm asking why. So I'm asking these questions and um, uh, I, when I conduct interviews, I do not have a tape recorder in front of me, but I momentarily write what I, um, what I uh, recorded and I'm sending that to, to my um, interlocutors for them to correct you know, minor things here and there. Okay, so uh, uh, this is something that I'm just placing aside. So I, I would I would hope to have I hope to have, let's say, uh, up to 30, 40 interviews by the uh, mid of the next year. Uh, and even if I have, you know, 20, uh, they start, in most cases, repeating one another, um, even if these people never talk to one another, uh, because, you know, when you hit when you hit a topic, a sensitive theme, um, uh, people uh, of different backgrounds uh, tend to give you uh, similar answers. And I'm, of course, I'm trying to make them think differently, but it doesn't always work. So what works in many cases is that I'm saying, okay, you said this in your written text 30 years ago, but now you are saying something different. How do you, how do you connect that? Okay, so uh, for me, the most important um, element in, in the interviews that I'm conducting is to match what the people were saying in the 1970s with what I say now. Okay, because of course, um, uh, Marinovich, who published his huge uh, uh, memoir uh, in English and in Ukrainian uh, a couple of years ago, says things differently. So um, I would consider uh, more trustworthy the memoirs that are published in the 1970s and early 1980s, right? The closer it is to the context that interests me, the more trustworthy are the texts. So then I would, I, I would say that Moroz and Chernovil and, and Levko Lukyanenko, whatever we think about them in the 1990s, are amazingly insightful. Uh, when they first time published their Seret uh, Snihiv um, uh, or Lichos uh, Rozumo or other uh, memoirs in the 1970s. So I believe I am answering your question. Uh, Anton uh, Proshova. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, thanks. Yeah, uh, Professor Stern, it's great opportunity to meet you. Um, I think I'm really honored and it's great, but I have a single question, people. Allow me, Professor. Uh, did the original background of Ukrainian dissidents impact upon their perception of Jews in terms of that anti-Soviet struggle in uh, in prisoner camps? I mean, uh, whether were there re certain regions more pro-Jewish, let's say, in terms of cooperation? Because there are, there are lots of stereotypes, unfortunately, still circulating. Of course. Look, we will live with stereotypes and we will, will die with stereotypes. Uh, for um, uh, many um, Ukrainians uh, who are finding themselves in correction colonies uh, who, and who are, let's say, from Galicia, um, the discovery of the Russian-speaking Jews is a wonderful moment where they can use their fervor, the enthusiasm of Ukrainian nationalists to tell the Jews, to really throw in the face of these Jews, folks, you are Jewish. You are trying to integrate into the Russian media. You are speaking the Russian language. Where is your Jewish identity? And um, oh, Zizils told me on a number of occasions that he was 
by and large, a human right activist. Yes, he distributed Solzhenitsyn. Yes, he distributed some, uh, you know, works about the state of Israel and, 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 and of Zionist descent, but he was a Democrat. He was not even a national Democrat when, when he got his first term. And in the correction colony, those particular Ukrainians made him think differently. The same with Haifetz, uh, the same uh, with uh, um, uh, Mendelevich. Um, in the writings of, of, uh, of the Jewish side, I find all the time they are saying because of Ukrainian impact, we became um, religious Zionists. Uh, we started to, to learn Hebrew and, and so on and so forth. That is, that is really amazing. So um, uh, that is kind of an impact uh, of the Galicianer, you know, of, of the Galician Ukrainians um, on, uh, on, the, uh, on, on the Jewish inmates. Um, there is quite a, quite a significant group of um, Ukrainians from uh, Dnipro, Kharkiv, and Kiev. They, are in the, they, they live in the towns with a significant um, uh, Jewish population uh, in which they find themselves in one of the same um, cohort, right? So they have more encounters uh, with, with the Jews in the correction colonies. Um, the question how their stereotypes influence what they say about the Jews. I would say that um, Ukrainians uh, from the central and eastern part of Ukraine would have less stereotypes. They will be less exposed to stereotypes. But it's, Anton, it's, it's a very interesting question. Uh, I don't think ever has, uh, anybody has ever asked this, uh, this question. And, and it, is, it is a valid question to explore, so bravo. Because if you if you would allow me just just brief yeah comment, please go, ahead. go professor ahead. because I'm first, Johanan. we we uh, we, we, we uh, got rid of all professors in 1917. Okay? So I, 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 my, it's my bad. I'm living in Poland. We have to say Shanovny Pani Professor and so on. Okay, uh, then call me Professor Doctor Doctor because <laughs> Shanov, uh, uh, yes, uh, Professor. If since. What I encountered in Jewish press, in Jewish media, in Jewish literature, that there are so-called good Ukrainians from Eastern, so let's, so let's say, Zuba sort of Ukrainians and the evil ones, Galicians. So unfortunately, that's been manipulated and still been used by the Russian Federation today. We're trying to make that animosity between the Jewish and Ukrainian suspension diaspora, for instance. Uh, right. Look, I agree with you if we talk about uh, what is written uh, by um, scoundrels such as Eduard Dolinsky. But who reads oh, yeah. these scoundrels? You know, who reads these scoundrels? You know, uh, they, are, they are not part of our conversation. And let them let bygones be bygones. Okay? But uh, when we talk about the writings of the dissidents, that's very important to mention uh, in 99.9%. Uh, Maybe there is a book that I haven't seen written by this. Maybe there is a memoir that I haven't read. But in what is uh, available, uh, most Jewish dissidents are very sympathetic toward their uh, Ukrainian inmates. Ursula, please. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, you may say that um, I'm outside the subject of this chapter, but I've been uh, studying uh, Odessa and interviewing people there over the last few months. So forgive me if I ask this question and, and you may say um, the context is too broad. I'm interested in the in the before and after of this period in the camps. Is your argument currently that it was the contact in the camps that led to this particularly high level of regard between these very high quality individuals? Or would you say that there was uh, something in either their interaction or uh, their predecessor's interaction beforehand, which might have conditioned that um, positive contact in the camps or not? And afterwards, uh, we know that uh, there were more highs and lows um, in collaboration since 1991. And, and um, we could absolutely, as Anton implied, say that the lows were uh, a lot to do with interference and the highs were a legacy from this kind of high level contact. 
but how how would you characterize that or, or you may say that this is not relevant directly um also three you asked me three questions so let me start with the third one um i don't think that um anybody pushed uh the elbow of nikola lukyanenko who became uh, viciously anti-Semitic after 1991 and who allowed himself really nasty statements. And he lost quite a bit of his credibility because of that. The same happened with Moroz. Um, um, I'm reading the Ukrainian press um, in the diaspora. Oh, and, and you have journalists who are shrugging their shoulders. Moroz was, was a, such a nice journalist and we consider him a national Democrat. He comes here, he says foolish things, right? So. Um, uh, nobody, um, I don't think that it is uh, the, the, the uh, Ruka Putina uh, who uh, uh, the, 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 that, that really pushed uh, these people to, uh, to become more, uh, you know, increasingly xenophobic. So yes, there were lows um, uh, and some of these lows were not necessarily uh, the uh, results of, uh, uh, of the uh, Russian uh, influence, uh, but uh, others of course were. Uh, so um, when we talk about uh, the, uh, the highs, uh, we need to say that that particular encounter and this particular dialogue uh, that was established in the correction colonies um, is something that have, uh, th th that dialogue, singular, that has shaped uh, the um, uh, Ukrainian Jewish um, interaction in Ukraine uh, over the last 30 years. And that is not that is not an insignificant period of time. Okay, so uh, and, and the fact that Ruch is um, uh, the the second thing Ruch does is uh, the Ruch um, in in the, uh, in nineteen eighty eight is trying to establish uh, the um, uh, Jewish faction of uh, of uh, the uh, movement, uh, not the Crimean Tatar not the Hungarian, not the Romanian, but the Jewish section of the movement also is the result of the same type of an influence. It's the influence of Zuba, it's the influence of Chernobyl, it's the influence of Lukyanenko of that particular time. Now, so this is, this is about your third question. Um, uh, getting back to your second question, um, I do think that there is um, an external context that shapes the um, encounter. And this external context, of course, is the attempt of the Soviet Union um, uh, authorities after the thaw uh, to curb um, any kind of national revivalist movement. In Lithuania, in Latvia, in Georgia, in Armenia, in, in Tajikistan, among the Jews, um, and so on and so forth. So this is a tendency, this is a policy. And um, uh, if you, um, as an authority, um, if you're trying to, um, uh, to check uh, the uh, rising national revival um, and you sentence people who are the participants of national revival, of course, you are bringing these people to one and the same uh, you know, correction colony you can, of course, you know, place them in different ones. Again, I don't know why they ended up all in Mordovia. But when they end up in Mordovia, they discover, oh, here is a Georgian, here is a Lithuanian, here is an Armenian, here is a Jew. Um, look at uh, Marinovich memoir. 90% um, of people who he talks about are the representatives of this national revivalist movements in, in the correction colonies who actually support him. Why so? Because these people feel the same kind of an oppression and the same kind of enforced assimilation. So it is the state policy that shapes uh, what happens to these people. It's not only that Marinovich, uh, you know, uh, wakes up in the morning and says, you know, I would like to be befriend a Jew, right? It doesn't happen that way, okay? So this is the answer to your second question. And the answer to your first question, um, I believe is, um, is very simple. Before, the, um, uh, be before these different um, uh, inmates uh, become inmates uh, and before they, they get their terms, uh, they are part of, uh, of a very broad environment that we can call Soviet intelligence. These people can be engineers. They can be, um, uh, you know, Ita Erovsky Robotniki, right, as they are called. Uh, um, uh, they, they can be 
uh, uh, biologists, uh, librarians, um, um, as one lady in Odessa Library uh, who is actually sentenced for distributing um, the uh, clandestine works of Ukrainian uh, dissidents in Odessa, and she is of Jewish descent. So uh, they can come from different walks of life, but what put, brings them together before the correction colony brings them together is their dissatisfaction, not necessarily rejection, but dissatisfaction with the uh, Soviet realities. So um, if you are dissatisfied, you are looking who to talk to who is also dissatisfied. So these people were destined to find one another. And I do see that um, if, we, if we take the um, Oxford Webster, Oxfordian Webster that discusses the uh, provenance of the word intelligentsia, the, the old fashioned uh, uh, definition of the word intelligentsia is a group of the society which does not kowtow to the majority opinion. Well, that is an excellent uh, way to uh, define uh, the dissidents broadly conceived. Not necessarily those who participate in human rights activities, not necessarily those who are uh, um, uh, getting together to sing kolatki, um, uh, New Year carols, uh, Christmas carols, and, and organize uh, the singing of the New Year carols as, 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 as a moment of political, as a political statement. Not necessarily those, but simply people who are discussing, who are talking, people from the kitchens, from the Soviet kitchens. Uh, the moment they find themselves dissatisfied with, this, with the Soviet authorities, with the Soviet power, um, not in terms of what kind of sausage you get or do not get in the store, but in terms of your spirituality, in terms of your educational endeavors, in terms of what you can or cannot read, that moment makes these people look for the interlocutors. Right. So um, if they do not find themselves, let's say there is no idea of sentencing these people to different terms. Let's say there is no 1970s. Right. Let's, let's allow ourselves to think they are not sentenced. Let's say Shellist is not uh, ousted from power. Let's say some sort of a thought is continuing. You would have more Jews surrounding Zuba. You would have more Ukrainians joining Plush in his attempts to reach out to the Jews. And um, if you have more refuseniks, let's say the Soviet Union, if we are talking about different type of 1970s, let's say there is no SALT1 and there is no SALT2, there is no um, increasing Jewish immigration from 1971 till 1979. So these Jews stay in, of course, there will be more Jews who are stretching, uh, uh, who, who are reaching out to the um, um, representatives of uh, uh, Ukrainian milieu. So I answered all your three questions. Thank you very much. Thank yeah. you. Really Kirillo. Yeah, by the way, folks, if you want to ask questions in Ukrainian, uh, please do so. I would not tolerate Russian, but Ukrainian I would. Kirilla, please uh, unmute yourself. Once again, yeah. can you hear me now? Yes, yes, I do. I will try in English, but if I get, uh, if it's not going to work, I'll switch to Ukrainian. So I have a remark and uh, one question. Uh, first, I, I had... Uh, I had an honor or opportunity to work in the SBU, SBU archives as well. So my focus was uh, is still the miners movement in Ukraine, but I was and and uh, I was starting like from 1988. But I was amazed about the fact um, how important Zionism or Zionism as uh, an object of surveillance was for the KGB. Yes, every every ten days, perhaps uh, the leadership of the Communist Party of Ukraine would get a report from the KGB, from the Republican one, and you you will see that there are two main objects of surveillance. First of all, Ukrainian uh, nationalists. Okay, it's clear, it's not a surprise. But then Zionists, 
whether it's clear that it was not a real threat uh, for, for, for the stability of the Republic or whatever. So, and uh, I was, uh, I'm, I'm asking myself, you, you, uh, you explained a lot of about the situation in the camps. Let us name it as a, a, a pull factor, bringing people together so that co they communicate and so on. Uh, and I'm, uh, I'm asking myself, how does it relate uh, to the official ideology of the Ukrainian Republic at the time? I mean, Valentin Volanchuk, were uh, the main ideologist uh, under Shcherbitsky, uh, the new type of um, anti-Zionism, especially after the Six Day Year War in 67 and then Yom, Yom Kippur War, rapprochement of the Soviet human, Union with the Arab states. And we have something, I guess, I'm not a specialist, but I guess there is something new like uh, uh, Israeli fixed uh, type of anti-Semitism becoming an important part of uh, official ideology. Well, especially under Malanchuk in Ukraine, in any case. So we have leaflets, we have a lot of official uh, anti-Zionist uh, uh, literature, and we have uh, these parallels, like bringing them uh, Ukrainian nationalists and Zionists together, uh, depicting them as partners in crime. So really we have these caricatures uh, uh, showing them together, the, the, the Zionists and, and the Banderits. And, and um, I don't know much about uh, this uh, quite interesting part of the story. And I'm asking myself, oh, if this thing, like official propaganda bringing them together, showing them as uh, accomplices, as, as uh, bad people doing bad things. Does it has something to do what happens in the camps? Is, is it, Thank you. Is the question. Yeah. yeah, you managed, you managed, Kirill. Thank you. Uh, look, um, um, I'm very happy when people ask me questions about something that I have already prepared and put in my PowerPoint. So uh, let, me, uh, let me get back to something I did not have time to discuss. Um, uh, so uh, you mentioned Melanchuk, and you mentioned pull factors uh, that bring uh, Zionist-minded and, uh, and nationalist-minded, uh, Zionist-minded Jews and, and nationalist-minded Ukrainians together. And you also wanted to say that, but you did not use the word. You wanted to say push factors that really throw these people to one another. And of course, there are push factors. In the 19, um, uh, late 1970s, especially e early 1980s, um, and increasingly so after Six Days War and after Yom Kippur War in 1972, uh, the Soviet authorities um, started a new campaign, uh, which was uh, um, officially anti-Zionist campaign. And of course, it is dictated by the role of the Soviet Union in the Cold War. Um, it is a huge topic. I would not go into that, but I'm interested in how all of that is zoomed in and how it is uh, influencing my people. Let's say, what is going on in Ukraine? and what is going on among the Soviet intelligentsia um, in big cities of Ukraine. So what happens is that uh, this is the time, um, especially starting from early 1970s, when uh, Malanchuk um, and, um, and also Fedorchuk, uh, the, the new head um, uh, of uh, the KGB after Nikitschenko, um, are commissioning um, uh, the Jews um, or people with Jewish last names, such as Schulmeister, such as Brodsky, um, to write books about um, Zionism um, uh, that um, are published um, anywhere from 30 to 150,000 copies uh, that are uh, distributed through the kiosk. So you can buy these kind of books that are in front of you in uh, practically any kiosk in Kiev, Lviv, Kharkiv, uh, Odessa. And uh, these books, um, uh, do bring together very important issues um, about 
um, Zionists uh, and Zionist-minded people, not necessarily in Israel, because anti-Israeli books about the um, militaristic policy of Israel and about Israel, uh, you know, exploiting the Palestinian people and all of that crap, uh, I leave aside. I'm interested in what these books are telling us about Zionists in Ukraine and about Ukrainian nationalists in Ukraine. So books such as Lujitili Ada uh, by Shulmeister, um, uh, The Servants of, of Hell, uh, or Yag Vinayo, uh, by Accused by Belayev, or uh, Zionism, uh, uh, The Weapon of Reaction, these books bring together Ukrainian nationalists and Zionists, and they show that Ukrainian nationalists and Zionists were responsible personally for the um, um, assassination of uh, uh, hundreds of thousands and millions of uh, ordinary Jews um, on the Ukrainian territory during the Second World War. So uh, if, you, if you are interested whether, uh, you know, any kind of Ukrainian Jewish rapprochement is ever discussed in the Soviet publications, I would say, yes, of course. Look at that. Belayev. Почему митрополит Равина спас? It is about Sheptitsky and it's about David Kahane, right? You can read about that, but it is about the bourgeois nationalist elites on the Ukrainian side who are helping the bourgeois nationalist elites on the Jewish side at the expense of 160,000 Jews that are brought to Lviv and um, uh, who are then deported to uh, uh, Yanovska or uh, camp or to, or, or to Belgians. So this is what is produced at that time. And of course, um, uh, this is an enormous push factor because um, anybody who reads this book uh, would, as, as they did in the Soviet Union, uh, read it um, uh, between lines and would see, okay, so there is very interesting encounter of the Jews and Ukrainians who are helping one another, right? So this is what um, uh, you, Kirill, and I uh, would read if we read this book in 1976. Others would read these books and uh, they would think that, yes, of course, you know, those nasty banderivtsi, those nasty banderites um, are in the same, um, on the same page with those nasty Zionists uh, who are uh, xenophobes and racists and so on and so forth. And of course, you mentioned caricatures and look at that. Uh, this is uh, 1981. This is just at the time when Andropov is discussing um, how to establish uh, the uh, infamous uh, uh, Soviet um, anti-Zionist uh, committee uh, that comprised, you know, very important uh, uh, representatives of Jewish intelligentsia, including Maya Plisetskaya, the ballerina, including uh, the uh, the general uh, Dragunsky and and others, uh, uh, you know, important writers, poets, and so on and so forth. Uh, so. Um, there in Moscow, they are discussing uh, how to create this anti-Zionist committee uh, to show that Soviet Jews are not um, uh, in any particular manner supporting uh, Zionist ideology or the state of Israel. And at the same time in Ukraine, um, in the journal uh, Peretz, uh, I don't remember what is the um, circulation of journal Peretz, uh, but I would not be surprised if it is uh, uh, about uh, half a million copies. Uh, this journal is, is, uh, uh, is a periodical that you can buy in any kiosk. Um, and, uh, and here you have uh, the um, uh, Ukrainian um, nationalist uh, who is in a bluish, yellowish um, uh, uniform. Um, um, and uh, of course he has swastikas because he is a banderite um, and a uh, Ukrainian trident um, on his um, um, uh, cap hat. Um, and he is uh, running next to a stereotypical anti-Semitic uh, with all racist features uh, Jew, uh, depicted Jew um, uh, who has the Morgan David, the, the, the six pointed star, which are actually um, uh, brought together for the first time. So Ukrainian painters are uh, really uh, very inventive. They are bringing um, the six-pointed star and, and trident um, together on the harness 
um, uh, that uh, these two uh, representatives of two nationalist movements are uh, uh, bringing together and who they are driving. And they are driving, of course, Holodna Vina and uh, So they are driving the um, H-bomb uh, um, and uh, the idea of the Cold War uh, and of capitalism and uh, on uh, behind this um, um, militaristic um, uh, deprecating female image of the Cold War, uh, there is um, also uh, some sort of, of a creature um, uh, that um, uh, that sits and, and, and uh, shows that it is uh, uh, supporting the voice of America and uh, the radio liberty and, and everything else which is connected to the ideological front of the Cold War. Um, and the poem uh, on the right-hand side says, not the true love unites them, but rather dark rage, anti-Soviet nature. Thus they are pulling in the same harness, the squeaky wagon of the Cold War. Vodni upryashsi, ni, jich jednaje ne lubov haracha, a čorna ljuć antiradjanska vdača, tomu vodni upryashsi i pruć vani skrepuči viz holodnoj vijni. Okay, Mikhalkov would um, commit suicide because beautiful, beautiful poetry, of course. So um, this is a kind of um, of, um, of propaganda um, posters uh, or propaganda um, uh, cartoons that you see in Pravda, Trude, um, uh, uh, Ukrainian newspapers, um, uh, in uh, Krokodil, in, in Peretz. Uh, and that, of course, has a major impact. When you see that, um, um, and uh, if you are uh, belonging to the Ukrainian camp, you ask yourself a, a question, you know, maybe, maybe there is something there. Maybe we should go to these people. Maybe there is something that, uh, um, uh, that, that we share, uh, you know, politically, cultural, and so on and so forth. And of course, for, the, uh, for others, uh, in the, uh, for other readers, it would be the sign that, you know, uh, anybody who is a Benderite and anybody who is a Zionist are people to be avoided. So that's that's my answer, Kirill, to your question. So so it is a well-known phenomena, and uh, of course uh, it will be a kind of a chapter in a book. Other questions, folks? So I would suggest if you don't have any further question, then we can just wrap it up here because we're already a little bit out of time. Okay. I, I would like to thank you very much for such an interesting and very, very insightful talk, such a beautiful presentation. Um, thank you very much. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and thanks for participating. And, and your, uh, some of your questions are uh, really, most of your questions are insightful and they help me to shape um, uh, what I'm thinking, what I'm doing. Uh, Andrija, uh, щиро дякую за uh, можливість uh, презентувати роботу, яка, власне, є uh, ще не написаною, а тільки пишеться. Uh, я дуже вдячний всім, хто тут був присутній. Uh, uh, вибачаюсь uh, за uh, якісь такі uh, паузи в презентації, тому що в більшості випадків, звичайно, в мене є uh, написаний текст переді мною, а тут я вирішив, що я вам представлю роботу, яка є тільки чернеткою о, не написаного тексту, але о, сподіваюся, що о, незабаром в нас буде і написаний текст. Так, о, о, Олександра, дякую вам за вашу підтримку. Окей, okay. all the best, take care. Далі um, буде, як то кажуть. We have next week uh, the talk by uh, Katerina Hryshenko on the on the topic of Nikolai Gerzivanov, published from Katerina Slav, Ordinary and Uncomfortable. So if some of you want to join, we'll be really happy to see you there. Thank you for the participation today. All the best. <laughs>